Leslie kept struggling and Colin made the decision to actually get on top of her and hold her down, with the duvet over her face and the carbon monoxide pumping into the little airspace that was left. He had the hose pipe in place with his right hand and with his left, he held her head down, hard, until he felt her stop struggling and stop breathing. This is Red Rum. Stories about the true victims of crime. The Killer Dentist, part two. On that Sunday after Leslie's dad's funeral in May of 1991, when Leslie had told Colin, quote, this is going to be over soon, I'm going to go to heaven, maybe you and Hazel are meant to be together, I'll never get over this, Trevor will never get over this, end quote. Colin had waited for her to fall asleep and then hugged her. For the first time in a long time, he said he felt like he could help her. He felt love for Leslie. He knew in his mind that killing his wife wouldn't be, quote, evil or wrong, as he later told a psychiatrist. He believed it would be a solution that would be good for his wife, something that would relieve her of her pain, a form of euthanasia, an act of mercy. He also stated that their children would benefit from Leslie no longer being around. In his eyes, those few words from Leslie before her drunken sleep were permission enough for him to set about a plan to kill her. After Leslie had said that, you might remember that she fell asleep and Colin headed straight over to Hazel's house. It was then that he first spoke to Hazel about the plan he was formulating to kill both Leslie and Trevor to save them from the pain they were feeling and to become one big happy family themselves. One morning, not long after that, Hazel and Colin were in her car, parked just outside Castle Rock, when Colin discussed what would happen in detail. Quote, I have a plan for Trevor and Leslie that can look as if they committed suicide, but I need your help. End quote. He went on to say that he could make it look as though they'd taken their lives if the cause of death was carbon monoxide poisoning. Hazel's initial reaction was shock and that it would never work. She thought it was a ridiculous idea, but the more Colin spoke about it, the more on board she became. And it was clear that Colin needed her. He couldn't do it without her. He reassured Hazel that their deaths would be painless. He wanted to make sure of that, What a lovely thing, Colin. He also stated that they would need both Leslie and Trevor to be sedated. As part of Trevor's work with the police, he was registered to carry a firearm and owned one. It was very possible that if Trevor was awake or fully with it when Colin carried out the murders, Trevor may well grab his gun and shoot him. With that revelation, Colin reached into his back pocket and pulled out a packet of anti-anxiety medication. He handed it over to Hazel and told her that he'd got them from his mother. She sometimes used them to help her sleep. He then instructed Hazel to crush a few pills with the back of a spoon and then sprinkle the powder into Trevor's food. With that, he'd be sedated and Colin could kill him with ease. The actual events of that fateful Saturday afternoon were that after Colin had finished putting together his son's birthday present, that colourful plastic slide, he then grabbed the baby's feeding bottle. He cut it in half and squeezed the neck of it. Then he forced it into the end of the garden hose that lay nearby. The celebrations of Daniel's second birthday continued through the rest of the afternoon and into the evening, which meant that the children stayed up a couple hours past their usual 8pm bedtime. Colin planned for this as it meant that they would be tired and more likely to sleep through the night. He put them down at around 10pm and as he closed the door to their bedroom, he propped a hockey stick in front of the door handle, wedged in such a way that they wouldn't be able to open it from the inside. They wouldn't be able to see what Colin was doing to their mum. He knew Leslie would likely fall asleep on the sofa He needed this to be the case because he knew the hose wouldn't reach all the way into the bedroom. If Leslie had decided to go and sleep in the bedroom, he'd have to execute his plan another day. Thankfully for him, and sadly 
for Leslie, she did head into the living room that evening after she'd changed into her pyjamas. She had with her that box of red wine that she kept pouring from into her wine glass and headphones on, corded up to her headset. And, just as Colin had hoped, she did fall asleep on the sofa. Colin made his way into the garage and took out some surgical gloves he'd stashed away from the dentist surgery early on. He took the baby's bottle he'd prepared that afternoon and placed it over the exhaust pipe of his car. He then took the hose and pulled it through the garage to the house, through the kitchen leading to the living room and placed it nearby to where Leslie lay lying. Colin made his way back into the kitchen, through to the garage and into his car. He braced himself. He turned the ignition on and let the car run for a few moments. Then he got up and went back out of the garage and through to where Leslie was lying in the living room. He pulled the hose tight and placed it facing Leslie. Then he tucked it under the duvet and made sure the quilt covered Leslie's whole face. At this point, the nozzle was just six inches away from Leslie's mouth. Once he was convinced the hose was stable in place, he retreated to sit outside of the living room. He sunk down to the floor just on the other side of the door and waited. He waited for a good few minutes before he heard Leslie moving. In a panic, he barged into the room and straight over to the sofa where she lay. The duvet had moved down slightly, meaning that the deadly carbon monoxide now wasn't pumping into Leslie's lungs, but more so the whole room. He pulled the duvet back up over Leslie's face, but as he did so, she began to struggle and then spluttered and called out a word. Matthew. In this moment, where she almost certainly realised her life was in the ultimate kind of danger, she called out for her son, Matthew. Leslie kept struggling and Colin made the decision to actually get on top of her and hold her down, with the duvet over her face and the carbon monoxide pumping into the little airspace that was left. He had the hose pipe in place with his right hand and with his left, he held her head down, hard, until he felt her stop struggling and stop breathing. By this point, Colin had inhaled a large amount of the carbon monoxide fumes, so rushed out into the hallway and gulped a few breaths of non-toxic air. Once he felt able to, he pushed back inside the room and pulled the duvet off of Leslie. He held his hand on her chest, checking to see if she was breathing. She wasn't. Leslie was dead. He reeled the hose up as quickly as he could so he could get out of the room and run away from the toxic fumes. He then made his way back through the kitchen and into the garage, where he turned the car off, pulled the hose off of the exhaust pipe and put it in the back of his car. He then went back into the living room and pulled Leslie towards him so he could remove her nightdress from her now limp body. He redressed her in leggings and a blue top, before hoisting her over his shoulders and carrying her to the car. He placed her in the boot next to the hose pipe. He covered Leslie's body with a blanket and piled his bike in on top of her. Then he jumped into the driver's seat and set off towards Hazel and Trevor's house. He had already called Hazel's house with the established one ring and hang-up method the pair had used in the early days of the affair. She had confirmed that Trevor was asleep sedated. She allegedly crushed up the pills and sprinkled them into a tuna sandwich that he'd eaten just a few hours earlier. She also said that she would move the car outside of the garage so there was room for Colin to park up inside the garage once he arrived. The journey only took 10 minutes and by this time it was well into the early hours of Sunday morning. Colin reversed his car into Hazel and Trevor's garage and got out. Hazel appeared confirming that Trevor was still asleep. She pointed to the lumpy sheet in the back of Colin's car and asked, quote, is that Leslie? Colin nodded, confirming it was. Colin walked through the back of the garage and into the house. It was a bungalow, so the hose pipe would easily reach into the bedroom this time. Colin made his way to the end of the bungalow and peeped through the slightly open door. He saw Trevor, fast asleep, lying on his front on the side of the bed, furthest from the door. 
Now that he knew what he was up against and his route up to the bedroom, he could get started. He went back out into the garage and got the hose pipe. He went back into Hazel and Trevor's bedroom and placed the end of the hose pipe on the bed next to Trevor's mouth. Then Colin made his way back to the garage with the hose pipe and attached it to the exhaust pipe. He turned the ignition on. Once he'd done that, he went straight back into the bedroom to check it was working. But when he got there, he realised that the hose pipe had fallen off of the bed and was now on the floor. With that, he noticed Trevor stirring and for fear of what had happened with Leslie happening again with Trevor, Colin pulled the hose pipe under the duvet and pulled the duvet over Trevor's head. But Trevor was a police officer. He was used to being on high alert and struggled hard. Over the next 20 seconds or so, Trevor managed to free himself out from beneath the duvet and he and Colin got into a struggle. They both ended up on the floor, with Colin bashing his head on something and then grabbing the nozzle and forcing it into Trevor's mouth. He somehow also managed to pull the duvet back up and over Trevor's head and after just a few more seconds, Trevor stopped struggling and his body went limp. As soon as he was able to, Colin darted outside of the bedroom. He'd inhaled a fair amount of the toxic carbon monoxide and felt sick and dizzy. He got into the garage, turned off the ignition and took a few moments to steady his breath. After he felt well enough, Colin marched back inside the bungalow and over to the bedroom. Outside, he saw that Hazel had placed clothes for him to dress Trevor in. He put the jeans, socks and blue jumper onto Trevor's lifeless body and then dragged him to the garage and into the back of the car next to Leslie's body. He pulled the sheet over them both and pushed the bike to sit on top of both of their bodies. He instructed Hazel to burn the hose, wash the bed sheets, and hoover the floor. He didn't want there to be any forensic evidence that could connect him to the crime. It was 3.40am when Colin got into the driver's seat of the car now carrying both his wife and Hazel's husband bodies. He drove out of the garage and on towards Castle Rock Village. Just a few moments later, he pulled the car over onto the side of the road out of the view of any other cars. He got out of the driver's side, opened up the boot and pulled his bike out. He threw it onto the grass and then hopped back into the car and made the final part of his journey. Not long after that, he arrived at a brick garage just to the back of what had been Leslie's dad's home. He backed his car right up to the garage, leaving just enough room to open the door. Once he'd done so, he reversed his car backwards into the garage, got out and got to work. He put on some more surgical gloves and then dragged Trevor's body from the back of the car, out, round the side and into the driver's seat. He attempted to position Trevor in an upright position, but because of how cluttered the garage was and the fact that Trevor was laying slumped downwards with his head at dashboard level, the most Colin could do was prop one of his hands on the steering wheel and push it to the side. Panic then set in. He couldn't close the driver's side door because Trevor's leg, bent at the knee, was blocking it. He tried a number of times to push his leg straight and force it into the car, But because of Trevor's heavy body and obviously no muscles holding him up, it was an impossible task. He had to leave it. The next task on his list was to place Leslie. He kept her in the boot but lay her on her back. Although Colin had dressed Leslie back at the house because she'd been planning on going to bed, she wasn't wearing any shoes. Colin had brought a pair of her white trainers which he forced onto her feet but he was worried Time was moving so quickly and he knew he needed to get home before any of the children woke up and before the morning traffic started to flow. He couldn't risk being recognised. He decided that to save time he wouldn't tie her shoes up and moved on instead to dressing the rest of the scene. He pulled out three family photos that he laid next to Leslie and then he placed the headset, headphones on her ears and pressed play on the Walkman he'd brought from home. The final and most important step was to make it look like a double suicide. This meant taking the hose from an old vacuum cleaner that he'd brought with him and attaching it to the exhaust pipe and looping it round into the car right next to Leslie's face. He then climbed into the passenger side of the car and switched on the exhaust. 
He couldn't get out of the car very easily. The driver's side was blocked by Trevor's body and the garage was too small to open up the other side of the car. So he pulled his way out of the car and climbed onto the roof and then slid down the bonnet towards the garage door. It was eerily quiet, except for the tinny sounds of Leslie's music playing through her headphones. Colin gathered up the sheet he'd used to cover the bodies, pulled off his surgical gloves and closed up the garage behind him. He turned towards the path outside and began to run. He kept running as fast as he could until he reached the spot he'd left his bike earlier. He jumped onto his bike and made his way back to his family home. Once he was there, he checked on the children, still sleeping soundly in their beds, before calling Hazel. She looked at the time, it was a little after 5.30am by this point. Colin needed to check that she'd done everything he required. She'd done a thorough clean-up, including washing the covers and sheets from the bed, and burned the hose pipe, the murder weapon. She assured him she'd done it all. Now, it was his turn. Colin made his way into the living room, where he closed the windows he'd left open the night before. By this point, he couldn't smell any kind of toxic fumes, so he knew the night's air had done its job. He then got to work lighting a new fire, where he burnt the clothes he'd been wearing whilst committing the murders, as well as the surgical gloves and the bag he'd been carrying it all in. After he made sure all of the evidence was taken care of, and he had settled himself down, Colin began calling round, attempting to make it seem as though he was worried about his missing wife. He called his friend, Jim Flanagan, who he made go round to Leslie's father's house to see if she was there. Unfortunately for Colin, on the first attempt, Jim hadn't actually been able to get inside the house or the garage. He did have a peer in, but when he couldn't see anyone, and no one came out to greet him, he returned to tell Colin that Leslie wasn't there. Obviously, Colin knew this wasn't the case, and pushed him to go back and check again which is when he found both Trevor and Leslie inside the car, dead from carbon monoxide poisoning. It wasn't long after that that the feigned grieving process began. It went on for days and then weeks. And as the time passed, the church elders began to become a little bit suspicious of Hazel and Colin. Not that they believed it was murder at this point, but they did believe the affair had continued and they weren't happy about it. One day, Colin was visited by the pastor who told him that Hazel wanted nothing to do with him. This was a shock to Colin who, up until this point, had assumed he and Hazel would continue as planned and set up a life for themselves together with their children as one big happy family. Quote, Hazel, the pastor has given me the message from you that although with your heart you want you and me, You now realise with your mind that it's best to never get together again. Is that true? I must know because if it is, you must ring me and only say it is true. Don't allow me to think there is hope if there is none. You will kill me. I can accept it now if you say it, but I can't allow myself to progress to find out later. And you must decide now about our future and not wait to see. I will not ever try and change your mind no matter how lonely I get. Colin has some very uh, clear narcissistic tendencies and in court he was described by the psychiatrist as narcissistic. This letter, and I'll go on to read a bit more in a minute, is a really clear example of those tendencies. He needs to control the situation, he's doing that here, even in the opening of this letter. Even if Hazel decided to leave him, she must call him and tell him. She must do it on his terms. Beyond that, he assumes he knows the pastor's most inner thoughts and he assumes he's wrong in what he might be thinking, which is what he goes on to say. His narcissism forces him to place himself at the top of the hierarchy. He's safe there and he is always right. Quote, The pastor, first he told me he will do everything in his power to stop us from getting together. That... I believe is not his thinking mind, but his very strong emotional reaction of anger and guilt at their deaths. He's a very clever man and is capable of convincing you that our marriage would be a disaster and will, in days to come, continue to convince you if you remain uncertain. 
If, with your mind, not your feelings, you accept what I think, then we will both go to the pastor and tell him that in the long term, maybe one to two years, we have decided now to get together later. But we will give him certain reassurances so that he can accept for the sake of the church what we would say to him, end quote. Narcissists never want to be uh, responsible for the outcome of their actions. So when things don't go according to plan, as they haven't with the pastor getting involved, Colin has to do everything he can to put the blame and responsibility elsewhere, this time on the pastor. Quote, I will set out my proposals at the end. I will deal with the three things he used to convince you our marriage would be a disaster. End quote. He then goes on to list the three things, those being that Hazel's daughter, Lisa, didn't like Colin. He says that he heard her say so, but she and Hazel's son, Andrew, would be so loved by him and that they'd soon learn to like him. Then he talks about Hazel's grief for Trevor and he lists off a number of instructions and things that they, quote, must do when they miss Trevor and Leslie. He says that they will only get together once they've gone over the deaths. And he ends by talking about the fact that if she does decide to be with him, then they will need to leave Coleraine eventually. Quote, If in your heart, Hazel, you really think it's over for us, then you must say it. If you can say without doubt that we can overcome these problems given by the pastor, then say yes to me and don't look back. We will meet with the pastor and tell him our plans. We will ask him to counsel us if he agrees. We will be honest and open and not secretive. We will lose many friends who won't accept us, but we can walk down the street together, proud of each other because from now on, we are forgiven and will be disciplined and will honour God. And we won't lose our friends if we take our time. I have taken a mother from my children, but God will provide for them and I only hope and pray it can be you. But only if you can accept in your mind as well as your heart. Love, Colin. There's such a lack of boundaries here of any kind. Colin believes that Hazel belongs to him and he uses those phrases like our friends and we are forgiven. He's written this long uh, rambling letter, which in, in some places doesn't even make sense and he's forced it upon Hazel. He's assuming that Hazel does ultimately want the same thing as him. He just needs to get her to see that. He can't believe that there's ever been a moment of doubt from her. Colin didn't hear anything immediately after he sent that letter. Hazel was busy attending Trevor's funeral. At his funeral, Trevor's brother noticed bruising on his face. He'd been told that Trevor and Colin had gotten into some kind of physical altercation and the bruising had come out quickly and was obviously there at the open casket for everyone to see. It was never looked into or questioned by the police. In fact, nothing was ever questioned by the police. Not long afterwards, both Hazel and Colin were made to leave the church. This was devastating for both of them, but they quickly joined separate churches a few miles away. During this time, Colin and Hazel weren't sleeping together. The guilt that Hazel felt, combined with her religious beliefs, meant that she had convinced herself and told Colin that they couldn't have sex. If they weren't having sex, they weren't sinning. And if they weren't sinning, then God would protect her. It wasn't long before Colin's frustrations overrode his desire to appease Hazel. One of the things that he offered as part of his dentistry work was gas and air as a means of pain relief. One evening... Long after dental surgery had closed for the night, Hazel and Colin made their way into Colin's surgery room. Hazel lay down on the chair and Colin gave her gas and air. In this euphoric and extremely relaxed state, the couple did manage to have sex. It's unclear as to whether Hazel was conscious or whether she actually consented to it. Using sedation on the woman he was having sex with was appealing to Colin, but what was more appealing to him was the opportunity that he found when female patients came into his dental surgery. He tended to use either gas and air, which is nitrous oxide and oxygen, or for more complex procedures, he would use hypnovil, 
Hypnovol is uh, known to have side effects of short-term amnesia after it's administered. After the actual surgery had taken place, Colin was often left alone with the female patients, where he would then take them to the recovery room. Sometimes the women in question wouldn't have any recollection of the time after surgery until some hours later. By 1995, Colin was becoming desperate. He wanted to marry Hazel, but she had a complete change of heart. She told him that she could no longer cope with the guilt. She didn't want to deal with his children as well as her own. And if she remarried, then she would lose Trevor's police pension, which she needed to survive. The breakup, much like their torrid affair, was not simple. Colin couldn't let Hazel go and Hazel couldn't be completely honest with him. The way the whole thing ended was one night, Colin actually ran into Hazel in a restaurant. She was with another man and his children and she'd been seeing this man for some time. Obviously, Colin despised this and couldn't cope with not having control over her so he would spy on her. He turned up at her house in the middle of the night, turning his car lights off and just sitting there watching the house for hours. Other times he would put on his jogging gear and run into the woods behind Hazel's house, waiting, watching for any sign of movement, any twitches of curtains, and occasionally a sighting of both her and her new partner. The relationship fully ended after eight years, by which point Colin had moved on and was now living with an American woman called Kyle, who had children of her own. She and Colin got married and over the next few years had five children together. During the first 18 months of their marriage, things moved quickly and one day, Colin approached Kyle, who was sat on their sofa with their newborn baby. As she fed the baby, Colin turned to her and seemingly out of the blue, told her that it was all his fault. He had killed Leslie. He went on to tell her how he did it and that he'd also killed Trevor Buchanan. After the initial shock had subsided enough for her to speak, Kyle told Colin he needed to call the police and tell them everything. But Colin had no intention of doing so, at least not yet. He said that they needed to get the children sorted first, and that there was the matter of finances. With so many young children relying on them and no real money behind them, All of it was tied up in the house and in Colin's dental practice. He would need to sell the practice before anything else happened with his confession to the police. Quote, We can take our time and make sure everything is in place. But as time went on, it became clear Colin wasn't going to turn himself over to the police. He told Kyle that he knew God had forgiven him for his sins and Kyle should too. Fearing she didn't have much of a choice and, with time having passed and the initial shock having subsided, Kyle decided to keep quiet. Over the following years, life continued as normally as possible for Kyle, Colin and their family. By now, they'd had five children of their own together. But then, in 2006, a tragic turn of events happened that set Colin on a downward spiral. Firstly, Colin lost a close friend, Fritz, to a bizarre event. Fritz had contracted an infection from an abscess near his wisdom tooth that actually became fatal. Colin had done some work on Fritz's teeth a few months earlier, nothing related to the wisdom tooth. However, he did blame himself for Fritz's death. The following year, Colin's life was struck with tragedy again. This time, he got a call from a Russian number. The call was coming from St. Petersburg. It wasn't out of the ordinary for Colin to get a call from Russia. His son Matthew, the oldest of the now 10 children that Colin had, had been living there temporarily as part of a placement with his university. Colin's relationship with Matthew wasn't great. There was a constant tension between them because of how controlling Colin could be. Matthew would go as far to tell a few of his friends that he hated his dad. The phone call that came that day informed Colin that his son had been involved in an accident, one that almost didn't seem real. 
Matthew, or Matt, as his friends called him, had been in an apartment, his apartment, with his friend, when the two of them had had some sort of argument. It was around 4am and his friend had left, making the journey from the top to the bottom of the stone stairway of the apartment block. Matt had followed his friend out and was about to throw a key down the stairs so his friend could let himself out of the building, when he had slipped on the freshly polished floor. He'd been wearing socks and had apparently lost his balance. As he fell forward, he did manage to grab onto the lower handrail of the floor, but he couldn't hold on for more than a few seconds. He then fell almost three flights of stairs to the concrete floor below. The bloodstains from Matt's head wound were still there when Colin arrived to the scene to bring his son's body home. He was convinced, now more than ever, that God was punishing him for what he'd done back in 1991. This next bit of the story is absolutely ridiculous. I'm only going to speak on it briefly because, honestly, I can't even be bothered to give it the time of day. It's a weird, uh, sort of unexplainable decision that Colin Howe makes that does lead to his ultimate downfall. So it's worth talking about briefly, but honestly, it's ridiculous. I watched the ITV dramatisation of this story called The Secret, which I'd highly recommend. And the rest of the story I could get on board with, but this, I just could not believe it was real, but turns out it is. So, Colin got convinced to invest in this treasure hunting scheme based in the Philippines. The story he was told was that there was a huge amount of gold stolen in Southeast Asia by Japanese forces. That gold was then hidden in deep caves and under huge tunnels in the Philippines. The gold itself named after the Japanese General Admiral Yamamoto, is well known by various experts, many of whom question the reality of it ever having actually have existed, but it is known about, even if only in theory. Colin's friend sold him a story about a man called Alan, who apparently had been given maps showing a number of sites where this gold had been buried. They needed investments to be able to proceed with the recovery of the gold, because the sites were known to have been laced with explosives and toxic gas as a means of protecting it. Colin agreed to invest 50 grand to begin with. His only contact with this Allen guy was over email, and over the following few months, he came up with another 50 grand, this time reaching from the family's savings and ISAs. But as he paid out more money, more excuses came back from Allen. During one of the mining missions, apparently one of the men had been killed, another had been injured and needed urgent medical help, and it was going to cost. Having invested over 100 grand, Colin then turned to his friends and family and business associates to help foot the bill, but no one was as stupid as Colin. They could see his desperation and they could see the evidence of not aligning it, not adding up. They could see he'd been duped. By the end... Colin had turned over more than £353,000 to the scam. After this, it came to light that in order to fund this gold scheme scam thing, he'd been paid over £230,000 from dental patients for upcoming work. Work that he might not be able to complete now that he'd given all of his money, including some of theirs, away. And he owed the tax office over £250,000 grand from all his other income streams, some in property rented out, some in his dental practice partnerships. It wasn't long after this, after losing his friend Fritz and his son Matthew, after having all of his money scammed away from him and his wife Kyle having kicked him out, Colin decided he needed to repent. David Wilson, professor of criminology, reported in BBC Northern Ireland that Colin's confession was likely motivated by selfish reasons. Quote, Well, it's certainly not going to be remorse and it's certainly not going to have been guilt that led him to hand himself in. This is a classic case of calculation in terms of it would be better to fess up rather than face the circumstances he was currently living in. I also think it was intimately bound up with the relationship he had with his new wife. For a long period of time, Colin Howell has been a cunning, manipulative and controlling man 
and I think you would have to place his desire to bring these murders to the authorities' attention within that manipulative context. End quote. Colin's confession was long. He had returned back to the family home where Kyle was, looking after all of his children, and he told her of his huge financial loss and revealed that he had cheated on her a number of times, more than he could count. Towards the end of January 2009, Colin took three of his young children outside and told them to look at the starry sky above. He knew then this would be their final time together as a family. The very next day, Kyle called in three of the church elders and waited for Colin to return to the family home. Once he was there, he admitted that he had decided to confess because he'd been considering taking his own life and didn't want to commit what he saw as such a sin. He then began to tell the elders the truth about what had happened all those years ago, back in 1991. He spoke uninterrupted for over an hour whilst Kyle sat in the corner of the room, weeping. By the time Colin had finished, he was trembling and shaking. The stark confession started with the revelation that back in 2002, Colin had been with a number of other women. He also told the elders about the gold scam and that he was addicted to pornography. He was confessing now, he said, because he wanted to be accepted by God and forgiven. He admitted that before her death and before their marriage, he had pushed Leslie to have abortions on three separate occasions. And many years later, he'd done the same to Hazel when she'd fallen pregnant. He then began his confession. He admitted to murdering both Leslie and Trevor back in 1991, and he gave the elders the details that confirmed he was telling the truth. By a little after 10am that morning, one of the church elders had called the police to come over to the house. They arrested him and took him to the local police station. It took three days for Colin to confess to the murders of Leslie and Trevor. The process that followed was from confession to Colin pleading not guilty to having a full and long mental evaluation. Soon after his arrest whilst being held in prison, Colin entered a deep state of depression and was determined as unfit to stand further police questioning. A further psychological report determined that he had, quote, depressive, religious, grandiose delusions. And then another psychological report, conducted a few months later, found Colin's condition to be considerably improved. A doctor concluded, quote, his presentation is consistent with a personality disorder principally narcissistic in type. This would predispose him to psychotic episodes. His personality disorder is evidenced by this grandiosity, his need for admiration and his lack of empathy. Disregard for the feelings of others and a sense of entitlement permeate his thinking and behaviour. This grandiosity and need for admiration were particularly evident when he described himself as a small god who needed to be worshipped by women. End quote. The final stance was that although Colin was a charming, controlled psychopath, he was fully fit to plead, subject to further monitoring. Colin described Leslie as continually angry or icy and said that she overspent money and would hit him and, God forbid, put on weight through depression, probably because she was having to deal with managing a toxic, destructive husband. He went on to say that he didn't love his wife and at the time of the murders said he was deliberately focusing on the negative parts of Leslie so he could rationalise killing her. Quote, I overemphasised those so I could justify what I was doing. Ultimately, Colin was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 21 years. One of Leslie's very best friends, Valerie, said that she felt angry about the societal expectations of being a young, religious person in Belfast which meant that there was no option for divorce when things got difficult between Colin and Leslie. And in fact, there wasn't even the space for either of them to have sex with each other and then not get married. They had committed to an unrealistic and definite future from the moment they first slept together, even though they hadn't known each other for very long at all, nor did they really know who the other person was. With the conviction of Colin... The family and friends of both Leslie and Trevor demanded answers, 
He'd gotten away with two murders for the best part of 20 years, and he would likely have gotten away with it forever if he hadn't confessed himself. A report into the subsequent investigation after the murders, then ruled suicides, concluded that this happened because of the deeply flawed police investigation that did fail the families of Leslie and Trevor. Even though it was clear early on that both Colin and Hazel had lied in the days after the discovery of the bodies, detectives continued to believe that the deaths were in fact suicides. The report stated, this revealed an investigative bias which inhibited an effective and thorough inquiry lacking objectivity and focus. It's also clear when looking back at the evidence found during the initial discovery of Leslie and Trevor, that there are a huge amount of inconsistencies that weren't thoroughly investigated, or in most cases, not looked into at all. Firstly, we know that Colin was the person to push for the garage search where Leslie and Trevor were ultimately found. He pushed three separate times for the garage to be searched. Officers never even asked him why he wanted the garage at Leslie's dad's house specifically to be checked. We also know that Colin was the last person to drive the car that Leslie and Trevor were ultimately found in. When he placed Trevor's body in the driver's seat, he didn't adjust the chair to account for his much taller structure. This meant that Trevor's leg was left bent leaning outward. It's very clear from the photos taken at the time of the discovery of the bodies that Trevor could not have driven the car with the seat in that position. Another alarming point is that Leslie's shoes weren't fully on her feet. Colin hadn't even bothered to tie them up, but officers never even questioned this fact when her body was found. We know from Trevor's funeral, where there was an open casket, the witnesses noticed bruising on his face. Postmortem photographs clearly show mouth and nose injuries, as well as bloody wounds on the back of Trevor's head. Colin had previously stated the slight tussle he and Trevor had had earlier in the evening, and the officers accepted this version of events without question. On top of this, Colin had a large cut on his head. This came from when he and Trevor were struggling and when he fell onto the floor at the side of the bed. Again, officers didn't thoroughly investigate this line of inquiry. And even though Colin and Hazel's affair was known in detail, officers established that they had lied to them about certain aspects of the affair yet they were still able to be accepted as credible witnesses. The police also had a huge number of claims against Colin that they failed to investigate further or just completely disregarded. One of them was about the electric cable in the bath, where Leslie had called her friends and said she wanted to let them know in case anything happened to her. And the other was some information given to police after the murders, alleging that Colin had been medicating Leslie. Leslie had told her friends this before she died. These claims were also not investigated further. And finally, and this is a bit of a ridiculous one, there were spots of blood found on the jumper that Trevor was wearing when he was found. That blood was, and still to this day, has never been tested. So we don't know who that blood belongs to, but given the physical fight Trevor and Colin had inside the home, it could well belong to Colin. If this had been discovered initially, both Colin and Hazel may have been brought to justice much sooner. The officer, David, who was with Jim Flanagan on the discovery of the bodies, had his suspicions. Quote, I've always been suspicious of the circumstances of the case, maybe because of my background as an investigator, but I'm not aware of anybody else having similar suspicions. Obviously, I wanted to help the investigation, but because I was stationed in a different police division, I didn't want to stand on anyone's toes or make a nuisance of myself. But I really was very concerned that something bad had happened. In my own mind, I did not accept what had happened at face value." End quote. David had told the investigating officers directly involved with the scene that he had suspicions or concerns over the seemingly apparent suicide. He kept notes on thoughts he had or inconsistencies that came up that eventually turned to various theories but he wasn't one of the investigating officers, so as he said, there wasn't a lot more he could do. He had read an article just a couple years after the murder that sparked his interests. 
It told the true story of a man who had made his wife's murder look like a suicide. He'd asked her to write suicide notes as part of a project for a course he was doing. David had wondered if Leslie's so-called suicide note was in fact legit. In the aftermath of her death, he'd also noticed that Colin had started the moving on process fairly quickly, getting rid of a lot of Leslie's personal belongings very soon after her death. He also remembered that when he and Jim discovered the bodies of Leslie and Trevor, some elements of the scene felt a little off. Nothing of obvious note, but something felt odd about the whole thing. If the suicides had been intentional and legit, how did Trevor's leg end up lent up on the open driver's side door? Wouldn't the doors have needed to be closed and shut properly to ensure the full effects of the poisoning? It was also clear that Trevor had been making future plans, even on the day of his death. He'd made plans for an upcoming holiday, certainly not a sign of someone who was planning on dying by suicide. Although David wasn't able to do much himself, seeing as he wasn't involved in the investigation, he did pass his thoughts and observations on to the two investigating officers. It took a lot for him to do so because it was sort of out of the blue. Back in the early 90s, no concerns had been raised. No one had been arrested and there wasn't the faintest suspicion from the police team involved. So these kinds of allegations or even theories at this point could have been seen as insensitive and foolish. Quote, I had great suspicions after discovering the bodies. I was very unhappy. I believe something had happened that was not good. The lead investigator denied any knowledge of this information, however, and actually said that his team didn't know anything about the letter Colin had written to Hazel, ending, quote, I have taken a mother from my children, but God will provide for them, and I only hope and pray it can be you, end quote. The lead investigator denied any knowledge of this information, however, and actually said that his team didn't know anything about the letter Colin had written to Hazel, and if they did then they would immediately have launched a murder investigation owing to this line. Quote, I have taken a mother from my children, but God will provide for them and I only hope and pray it can be you. After Colin was sentenced to life with a minimum of 21 years, he agreed to be the star witness in Hazel's trial. He spent four full days in the witness box at her trial. He began by giving the reasons he had confessed to the murders, and why he was there now, speaking out against Hazel. He told the court he had no agenda. At this point, there wasn't any kind of personal benefit to him. He just wanted to tell the truth. He told the court that Hazel had been the one to seduce him initially. Quote, I walked into the spider's web. Now, flies go into spider's webs because they might think there is some food for them there. So I willingly went after the bait. And we got caught together in a trap and it proved to be so because of the end result. Control is a very complex thing. If I was controlling in one area, Hazel was controlling in another area. And so Hazel and I were waltzing together in time. All of the sidestepping was done together. I may have been the lead partner in the waltz, but Hazel was dancing in cooperation with that dance. I wasn't dragging her around that floor, making her put her foot to the left or right. She was doing it in perfect harmony on her own and willing, end quote. Colin went on to say that after Leslie became aware of the affair, she used to say that it would be better if she and Trevor were both killed in a road traffic accident. This was a sign for him. And so he began hatching a plan to arrange their deaths and make it look like a suicide. And finally, he presented his closing blow. The fact that Hazel was a fully willing participant in the murders of Leslie and Trevor. Quote, If you look at the murders, I wanted it and Hazel facilitated it. Nobody was dragging anybody in the wrong direction. End quote. Hazel swore she wanted nothing to do with Colin's murder scheme, but felt like she had to go along with it in the end or else he would kill her. When she was asked about the reasons she didn't leave Colin after the murders, why it took her over four years, she said, quote, I was scared to leave him because I didn't know what he'd do. I didn't know what he'd do and he had so much on me that he held all the power. There was no one who I could confide in. Even when he was taking me to the surgery and gassing me, he was experimenting on me and I knew it. 
How could I stop it? My self-worth was on the ground. I was holding a secret that no one knew about. Most of the time, I just wanted to die. I wanted it over. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't do anything. He always wanted to know where I was and what I was doing, and I couldn't talk to anyone. He had a hold on me. End quote. During the trial, a tape of Hazel's police interview was played. I'm going to play a reconstruction now. Do you accept Colin came here that night with your knowledge and without you interfering to murder Trevor? He had a plan to do that. This is what he wanted to do. I kept putting it off. He pressurised me. He kept at it. He arranged it for that Saturday that he would come back around and he did. I looked at the back of the car. I didn't know it was Leslie. He told me it was Leslie. At that stage, I felt like being sick. I had to run away. I didn't want this to happen, but he was there and he wanted to do this and I stood back. So on that Saturday day, you knew that on Saturday night something was going to happen? Yes, I knew something would happen. I was scared. I wanted the whole thing stopped and I didn't stop it. We are in no doubt, Hazel, that there was indeed a plan. And part of that plan was that two people would be killed. There was no evidence whatsoever that you took any steps to try and stop it. You allowed it to happen. You were part of the plan. You negotiated a date that this could happen. The plan all along was to involve carbon monoxide and part of the plan was to drug Trevor and part of the plan was that you would be involved in concealing vital evidence after the murder of Trevor and part of the plan was to continue with the deceit in relation to fooling police, friends and family. Yes. We are in no doubt it was calculated. It was vicious in relation to what you did, both of you. You showed no regard for your partners, for their families, and no regard for your own children. I do think it is worth mentioning here about the coercive control element of the relationship between Hazel and Colin. We don't know the full ins and outs of their relationship, and we likely never will, but it is clear that Hazel is seeking to use this as a key point in her next appeal. Back in 2009, when Hazel was convicted of murder, coercive control wasn't generally something that was known about, and it certainly wasn't used in legal cases in the same way that it is today. There just wasn't the research or information out there. But Hazel is alleging that Colin raped her on a number of occasions. And if she's able to prove this, don't get me started on the whole proving rape thing, but if she is, or if it's accepted, then she will be able to argue in the Court of Appeal that she was in no fit state of mind to know what she was doing when she assisted Colin in the murders. The tricky thing with this is that Colin has said that although he did sedate Hazel and have sex with her, she was in full agreement and was always conscious so could consent at all times. Hazel says this isn't true and said she never consented to being sedated so that Colin could have sex with her. Coercive control by definition is an act or pattern of acts or assaults, threats, humiliations and intimidations or other abuse that is used to harm, punish or frighten. This kind of controlling behaviour means that the victim is likely to become dependent on the abuser. They might become isolated from support or have their independence taken away from them, so it's incredibly difficult to then leave. Coercive control has only been a criminal offence since 2015, so it could greatly impact Hazel's chance of appeal. There's not really any point of me talking about what I think about Hazel and this particular aspect of coercive control, because I don't know enough about what she's alleging. And even if she is able to and decides to use coercive control as a base for argument in that court of appeal, she will still have an incredibly tough time proving it to an extent that allows her a early release. Hazel's lifestyle and all of her previous relationships were called into question during the trial. Hazel's eight-year relationship after Colin ended when she cheated on him. The man she had that eight-year relationship with told the author of Let This Be Our Secret, Derek Henderson, quote, I think Buchanan is a total grabber of opportunities. Nothing was ever good enough. She was materialistic to the hilt, cold-hearted, She should have told me at the start she didn't want me. She should have been straight with me from the start. She only wanted me around because I could do everything she needed. To me, she was as clever as Howell. She had me round her little finger. She could make me do anything, including spending money I didn't have. End quote. 
Ultimately, the jury believed the picture of her that was created by the various different witnesses, including Colin. Hazel was found guilty of the murder of both Leslie and Trevor, and the judge concluded that although Colin had planned and carried out the murders, Hazel was not eligible to have a reduced term because she had pleaded not guilty. The judge stated that Hazel had repeatedly lied and persisted in attempting to evade responsibility. She was sentenced to a minimum of 18 years before consideration for release. Hazel has repeatedly appealed, but each time has failed to have her convictions for both murders overturned. Just a couple of years after Colin was convicted of the murders, he also pleaded guilty to assaulting three patients from his dental practice. He said that he attacked two of those women more than once and that the crimes took place between 1998 and 2008. He publicly apologised to the victims, stating that he had drugged the patients before sexually assaulting them. And then, in 2018, Colin was questioned again, this time about a new claim of sexual assault. Colin's son, Daniel, who doesn't call him dad, said, quote, Colin murdered my mother, Leslie, sometime during the night of my second birthday. He always said that my mother committed suicide and as I grew up, I struggled with feeling rejected, believing that my mother wanted herself dead on my birthday, not understanding why she didn't care. During my childhood, Colin became more and more reluctant to talk about my mother with any of us. We stopped visiting her grave. All contact with her brother Chris was cut. This culminated with us being told we weren't allowed to talk about any of what happened among the family. I was denied any memory of my mother, as was my brother Johnny. For all of his life, my late brother Matthew believed his mother left him when he was six, and he shared with me the anguish that caused, and ways in which he blamed himself for what happened. With many thanks to Daisy Eccles and her dad for helping out with this. Um, Thanks for listening and I'll see you all next month.